Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back for part 3 of Paleozoic Earth History focusing on the late Paleozoic. So before we go any further, let's just get the code word out of the way. The code word for this lecture is T, I repeat T, T-E-A, T as in the hot drink. So please make sure you write that down, put it somewhere safe because you'll need it for the code word quiz. Okay, so in the previous lecture we had just been looking at the sequences which were deposited during the late Paleozoic. So now we're going to start think about, thinking about the tectonic processes that were going on during the late Paleozoic. So we're going to start with the ancestral rockies. So the ancestral rockies form between the late Mississippian and the early Permian. So during the Absaroka transgression, deformation in the southwest of Laurentia caused the uplift of massive fault-bound blocks producing the ancestral rockies. So essentially what we're saying here is we have uh, plate tectonics is pushing huge chunks of rock straight up out of the ground, producing topography. So this uplift produced mountains that were up to two kilometers in height, Erosion of the uh, Paleozoic sequences, essentially which are part of these mountains, then went and exposed the Precambrian rocks underneath, because obviously when this block of rock gets pushed up, it consists of both the Paleozoic rocks and beneath them are the Precambrian rocks. So obviously when the Paleozoic rocks get pushed up, they get eroded away and the Precambrian rocks become exposed. So we get substantial quantities of detrital sediment being produced by this uh, erosion. And of course, that's then going to get deposited into the Absaroka Epiric Sea. So the cause of the ancestral rockies is actually a little bit uncertain. They may have formed due to a, a couple of possibilities. The first one is they could have been formed by the result of sub, or due to the process of subduction occurring along Laurasia's western margin at that time or should I say, what is now the modern day West Coast at that time. So there was a subduction zone that was open along uh, Laurasia's northern margin, which is now the West Coast. And it could be the tectonic forces uh, produced by this subduction would be sufficient to lead to the uh, deformation that we see producing the ancestral Rockies. That's a possibility. But the problem is, is that the area that we're looking at is actually a very long way from the subduction zone. So that could be a bit difficult to achieve. The next option is the ancestral Rockies could be the result of the continent-continent collision between Laurasia and Gondwana, more, most accurately uh, the area around the Achetan mobile belt. It could be that the compressive forces uh, produced by this collision may have been sufficient to once again cause these blocks of rock to be pushed upwards. But the same problem actually occurs again. The area is actually quite a long way from the interface where this collision between Laurasia and Gondwana was taking place. So there's, you know, there's that problem as well. So there's also the, the third possible option, which is what we see is actually an interaction between the subduction forces, compressional forces coming from the west, and the compressional forces produced by the achetan orogeny, which is coming from the south. And where these two forces into, uh, where these two forces meet is essentially where we end up forming our ancestral rockies. So if we look at this map here, now to be clear, this map is actually from the early Triassic, but it shows you the pos position of the ancestral Rockies quite nicely. OK, so just ignore what's going on on the map here, because this does not represent what's actually going on when the ancestral Rockies were forming between the late Mississippian and the early Permian. But this map here just happens to show you the area that we're looking at quite nicely. So in terms of the ancestral Rocky Mountains themselves, they are they are occurring here. OK, in this area between Colorado and New Mexico. So what we have is we had a subduction zone that was running along what is now the modern day West Coast. So the possibility is number one, maybe the tectonic forces produced by this subduction zone caused the formation of the ancestral Rockies here. Possible, but it's a very long way from the trench here to the location of the ancestral Rockies. Option number two is that they are result they are produced by the Achetan orogeny, which is occurring right here, which is produced by the collision between Laurasia and Gondwana. But once again, they are quite a long way away from the location of the from the location of the orogeny. 
and so this is another problem you know because they're so far away it makes it a bit difficult to explain how you know that continent continent collision could possibly have formed them the final option is that we have a, a uh, essentially a combination of these two events we have the compressional forces coming from the west caused by subduction and we have the compressional forces coming from the south caused by the achetan orogeny and it just so happens that where those two forces meet is the location where we get the ancestral rockies so it may be some kind of interference between subduction on the modern day west coast and continent continent collisions occurring in what is now the modern day gulf region so that got we should say gulf coast region and uh, and that could be sufficient to produce the formation of the ancestral rockies so in terms of what's going on we can see here this is what we actually have we have these rather steep normal faults and the compression is actually pushing these blocks of rock stra more, almost straight up and so what's happening are these Paleozoic sediments, which were on top of the uh, Precambrian rocks here. Well, they obviously get eroded away when these blocks of rock get pushed up, and that causes the Precambrian rocks to be exposed. So here we actually have a picture of the Garden of the Gods. Uh, so this is from Colorado Springs. And so these areas of rock, which you can see sticking out, these represent the Precambrian crust that's been pushed up. And so obviously the Proterozoic rocks that were on top of them got eroded away. Over time, because the Precambrian rocks are naturally harder than the surrounding uh, Paleozoic sedimentary rocks, the Paleozoic sedimentary rocks eroded away and the Precambrian rocks got left essentially just sticking out of the ground. So that's what you're seeing here. And this is just simply due to these Precambrian rocks being pushed almost straight up by these normal faults. So by the middle Absaroka, we have more carbonates and evaporites. So the Absaroka of Pyrrhic Sea began its retreat in the late Carboniferous, not long after the transgression had begun. So the Absaroka wasn't actually around for that long. So by the early Permian, the sea occupied a stretch of, of uh, land which runs essentially from Nebraska to West Texas. And uh, essentially, that's uh, by the middle Permian. And sorry, and by the middle Permian, the sea was limited to the southern area of New Mexico and West Texas. So, as we can see, as we as we go through the late Carboniferous into the early Permian, the Absaroka Pyrrhic Sea is in retreat. So, the formation of thick evaporites in Kansas and Oklahoma indicate that the Absaroka Sea became restricted as it retreated southwestward. So, we ended up with these isolated bodies of water that got trapped as the rest of the sea retreated. And obviously, these isolated bodies of water would evaporate away, leading behind, leaving behind evaporite deposits. So here's our basic situation. So if you remember, the Absaroka of Pyrrhic Sea actually made its way quite a long way inland. But of course, as it began retreating, it begins retreating towards the southwest. And eventually we end up with a, a, an isolated body of water in this area right here. So it's separated from the, the open ocean over here by several large reefs. And so this area, this lagoon back here is essentially isolated. It's in a hot environment. And so we get evaporation taking place. And so the water begins to become more saline. So in the southwest, the Absaroka Sea of the Middle Permian formed three basins separated by two platforms. So here are our basins. We have the Midland Basin, the Delaware Basin and the Martha Basin here. And you can see that along the margins of these basins, we're going to get reefs forming and that's going to help to isolate them. So reef development along the platform margins uh, with limestones and red, sorry, <clears throat> let's try that one again. Reefs developed along the platform margins and we get limestones, red beds and evaporites deposited in the lagoons behind the reefs. So obviously we have evaporites which are being produced through the evaporation of seawater. We have the limestones that represent the processes that were going on before the isolation occurred. So remember, this area here would have been a carbonate producing area. So we have a sequence of carbonates. They then get followed by a sequence of evaporites. That's showing us this body of water is becoming isolated, evaporating, producing the evaporites. And then finally, we have a sequence of red beds coming over the top. Those are going to be desert deposits. And that's essentially showing you the area is now dried out and you have continental sediments moving over the top. 
So as the reefs increased in size, they eventually restricted the water inflow into these basins, and that led to late Permian evaporites gradually filling up these basins as the water in them evaporated away. So this map here kind of shows you the general position. So if you look, these are our three basins. Once again, the Midland, the Delaware, and the Martha. And if we look there, they are approximately on the diagram. So that's going to be the Midland Basin here. This is going to be the Delaware Basin. And this is going to be the Martha Basin. And you can see that the sea is trying to retreat out westwards, but these areas will become isolated. So we'll get reef development and essentially they will begin to eventually evaporate away. We'll get the evaporites being deposited. And then finally, once the water's all gone, we'll get desert sediments in the form of red beds coming over the top. So what about the mobile belts that are forming? Well, we've already touched on the ancestral Rockies, but when it really comes to it, we're, we're more concerned about the antler orogeny, which occurs on the modern day West Coast, and the Acadian orogeny and the um, Alleghenian orogeny, which occurs on the East Coast. So during the Neo-Proterozoic, that's the late Proterozoic and early Paleozoic, Laurentia's Western margin over here, or should I say modern day Western margin, was passive. So it was peaceful, boring, not much really happens. So during the late Devonian to early Carboniferous, we get several island arcs moving eastwards and they collide with the West, well, the modern day West coast. And one of these collisions ends up producing the antler orogeny. So during this time period, uh, tectonics along the West coast were rather complex. We had numerous short subduction zones appearing, and this eventually caused a basin between the continent itself and the island arcs that were present to be destroyed. So we have a Wilson cycle taking place. So the latter stages of this uh, basin closing up uh, was achieved by frosting. So we have the island arc itself and the sediments which were contained within the basin between the island arc and the continent being pushed up onto the continental crust of Laurentia. And this ended up producing the Antler Highlands. So erosion of the resulting Antler Highlands produced sediments that were deposited into the Epiric Sea to the east and to the west. So this is, uh, this is a pretty classic situation. There's nothing particularly special. It's just a, a normal situation where we get a, a rather large island arc, which is moving eastwards due to subduction, striking the west, what is the modern day west coast of North America. And that leads to the formation of the Antler Highlands, obviously because they're high ground, they're above sea level, they will then be eroded, producing sediment, which will then be deposited into the surrounding seawater. So next we need to think about the orogenies, which are related to the collision between Laurasia and Gondwana. So we're not actually going to do these in order. We're going to jump around a little bit. So we're going to start off with the most straightforward one, which is the Achetan orogeny. So the southern margin of Laurentia was passive from the Neoproterozoic to the early Carboniferous. So the area which is now the modern day Gulf region, uh, Gulf Coast region, was on the whole a relatively passive continental margin. So in the early Devonian, we see the oceanic crust between Laurasia and Gondwana begins to subduct under Gondwana. So we have a subduction zone that opens up along Gondwana's northern coast. And this starts to subduct the seafloor that sits between Gondwana and Laurasia. So the two land masses obviously begin to move towards each other. So the two land masses uh, hit each other in the early Carboniferous, and this collision continued through the Carboniferous and into the very early Permian. So it was quite a long event. So mountain building continued after the initial collision with stresses accommodated by large scale frosting and folding. So, you know, when the two pieces of continental crust hit each other, they don't just come to an instant stop. They keep plowing into each other for an extended period of time. And so all of these stresses that are being put into the rocks as they're still pushing into each other have to be accommodated somehow. And they're accommodated by either the rock breaking, in which case we have faulting, so frosting, or the rock will bend, so it will fold. So that's how we accommodate these pressures. And so this diagram here kind of summarizes what's going on 
as part of the achete and orogeny. So here we have uh, Laurentia. Okay, so this is going to be the area which is now modern day northern Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Here's our ocean basin, and to the south, off to the right, we're going to have Gondwana. So there's going to be a subduction zone that's opening up over here. And so this oceanic crust is subducting underneath Gondwana, which is off to the right. And so that means the, co the continental mass of uh, Laurasia and Gondwana are now moving towards each other. And eventually there will be a collision. And this is obviously going to lead to the formation of a continent continent uh, origin. So we're going to get the Achetan orogeny produced as Gondwana and Laurasia hit each other. So once again, not a particularly complex orogeny taking place there. So that's why we've uh, dealt with it relatively early. Now, now let's think about the final two orogenies of the Appalachian Mobile Belt. So we've already touched on the Taconic orogeny. Now that occurred in the middle to late Ordovician. So that was uh, early Paleozoic. And we've already touched on the Achetan orogeny in the previous slide. That's early Carboniferous to early Permian. In terms of what's happening along the modern day East Coast, we have two orogenies we need to discuss. The Acadian orogeny, that's early to late Devonian and the Alleghenian orogeny, that's middle Carboniferous to late Permian. Okay, so now let's really think about the, the big one, the Appalachian Mobile Belt. So the closure of the northern Iapetus Ocean between Laurentia and Baltica concluded during the late Silurian to early Devonian, and this produced the Caledonian orogeny. So that was a set of mountains that run along the what is now the modern-day east coast of Greenland, a bit of eastern Canada, what is now modern-day western Scandinavia, Scotland, and Ireland. And so that formed, a, that formed a set of mountains which we call the Caledonian Mountains. So the closure of the Iapetus was not complete until the southern portion of Baltica, and the microcontinent Avalonia made contact with Laurentia. So if you remember, it wasn't a, a simple collision. The collision wasn't just two pieces of rock bang into each other head on, and so that was it. The collision occurred you know, at the same time along the entire length of the impact zone. It wasn't like that. The impact actually began at the northern end of the zone, and over time it progressed southwards. So the collision produced the frosting and folding of the continental crust and associated sedimentary rocks from the seafloor, and this led to the formation of the Acadian orogeny as the Iapetus Basin closed up as it was you know, in a southerly direction. So the Acadian orogeny essentially represents the second stage of formation of the Appalachian Mountains. Remember, the first stage was the Taconic orogeny. So the mobile belt was primarily focused in Newfoundland and New England. So the Acadian orogeny uh, began in the early to middle Devonian as the crash between Laurentia and Baltica was beginning to finish. It concluded in the late Devonian. So the Acadian orogeny produced the Acadian highlands, as you would expect, so it's going to produce a mountain range, and they were located along what is now the modern-day east coast, but what would have been Laurentia's actual, actually its southern coast. The orogeny resulted from the early Devonian accretion of Avalonian terrains onto Laurentia's eastern coast. This essentially means small island chains associated with the microcontinent of Avalonia kept hitting the modern day east coast, and this helped to uh, cause the uh, Acadian orogeny. This was then followed by the late Devonian continent continent collision between Laurentia and Avalonia. Remember, Avalonia is this microcontinent that's attached to Baltica. So the Acadian orogeny is essentially initially a, a sequence of small island chains that hit the modern day east coast, and then that's followed by the big collision as we get this uh, meeting of Laurentia and Avalonia, as these two large pieces of continental crust hit each other. Now, some models for actually contradict this idea and they say no it wasn't mostly a a convergent process that produced a mountain range there's actually some models that suggest it might have actually been the result of a major strike slip fault so a transform fault so um 
The model suggests that the Acadian Highlands were produced by the southerly movement of a large piece of crust from the um, Avalonian, from Avalonia, essentially down what is now the modern day east coast of North America. So there are a couple of competing models as to how we form the Acadian Highlands. It's actually possible that it may be a combination of both uh, convergent and transform plate tectonics working together that help to lead to the uh, formation of the Acadian Highlands. So at the closure of this southern portion of the Iapetus Ocean, obviously uh, it happened later than the northern part. We've discussed how it wasn't a uniform closure. It moved in a southerly direction. So uh, marine sedimentary rocks from the floor of the Iapetus Ocean were thrust to the northwest during the collision. So they were pushed onto Laurentia. Erosion of the Acadian Highlands, because of course it's formed a mountain range, produced the continental red conglomerates, sandstones and shales of the Catskill Delta. So the Catskill Delta is just like the Queenston Delta. So it forms on the, um, on the western margin of the Acadian Highlands and it's another one of these clastic wedges where we have a thick sequence of sediments right next to the mountain range and it steadily gets thinner as you move away. The Catskill Delta thins from a maximum thickness of about three kilometers in Pennsylvania down to around 100 meters in Ohio. We get a corresponding 1.1 kilometer thick clastic wedge called the Old Red Sandstone, which is forming on the uh, European side of the Acadian Highlands. So that's going to be the area which is the uh, microcontinent of Avalonia. So this essentially represents what's going on. So over here, we have obviously Laurentia. Over here, we have Baltica, or should possibly be more accurately Avalonia. Avalonia was attached to Baltica at this point. So we have two pieces of continental crust smashing into each other. And obviously that's going to lead to the formation of a mountain range. So in terms of what we have going on, so here we have here we have Laurentia, which has crashed into Baltica, and that's going to give us the Caledonian Highlands up here, which are running along the east coast of Greenland, the west coast of Scandinavia. We've got uh, Scotland and an island uh, about here. And of course, this is going to be uh, northeastern Canada. So this entire area is going to be affected by the Caledonian orogeny. So the Taconic Highlands are going to be located down here. If you remember, the Taconic orogeny occurs in the early Paleozoic. But you can see what we have is we have several island chains just sitting off the coast and they are heading eastwards. So they're heading towards um, the what is now the modern day east coast. And obviously they're going to strike the east coast. And, and this will probably be the cause of the Acadian erogeny as these island arcs start to smash into the um, into the along the east coast of North America. Now at the same time, if we look here, here's Avalonia. Okay, this is this little piece of continental crust which is attached to Baltica. Well, as they hit each other, Avalonia is obviously going to eventually come smashing into this area here, which is modern day Canada and New England. And so the impact of Avalonia into this area as well is also going to lead to the formation of the Acadian Highlands. The Acadian Highlands is probably the result of several island arcs hitting the modern day east coast followed by a major continent continent collision as Laurentia hits Avalonia. Now there is however the other model and the other model says okay the island arcs probably hit but then the entire process was complicated by a major strike slip fault that forms and runs approximately north south. And so what happens is, is this major strike slip fault takes rocks from the Avalonian continent and literally pushes them down the modern day east coast. And as it's doing that, it will cause large amounts of deformation because it's, you know, trying to move a big, two big blocks of rock next to each other is going to produce deformation. And so that may also help to explain how the Acadian Highlands formed. Now, another possible explanation is that it's a combination of both processes. Maybe it's a combination of the convergent plate tectonics resulting from the island arcs and the continent-continent collision. And then on top of that, we have the added complexity of transform plate tectonics produced by this strike-slip fault. 
So the Acadian Highlands, the Acadian Orogeny is a bit of a complex one, but nevertheless it results in an area of high ground forming which extends from the east coast of Canada down towards Georgia. So by the late Devonian, here are our Acadian Highlands, they're well established. We obviously have our body of water back here. So this is where we're going to start forming the Catskill Delta. So we've already touched on the Achetan Orogeny. That began slightly before the Alleghenian Orogeny. So the initial collision was caused by a number of island arcs striking, well, the island arcs which are now situated essentially on what would have been, or is now the modern north coast of South America, hitting what is now the modern south coast of North America. So the main phase of the Achetan Orogeny occurs when South America hits the, it hits the modern day south coast of North America, which would have been the southwestern coast of Laurasia. So this occurred contemporaneously with the east coast uh, with the east coast of Laurasia making contact with Africa, and that is, that collision gives us the Alleghenian orogeny. So in fact, you know, what, I'm just going to step back two slides. So we can see we have these islands here. So here's Gondwana, here's Laurasia. Here we have the Acadian orogeny. So the next stage is going to be the Achetan orogeny, which is going to be focused here. And that's going to be produced by these island arcs starting to hit the, uh, the Gulf Coast region. And that's going to start the formation of the Achetan mountains. Now, what's going to happen then is then the main mass of Gondwana is going to come in. And when Gondwana makes contact with the coastline of Laurasia, it's going to continue all the way along. And so we're going to get contact initially here along the modern day east coast. That's going to give us the Alleghenian orogeny. And then we're going to get the Achetan orogeny continuing down here when the main mass of Gondwana makes contact with the continental crust there. So the Achetan orogeny and the uh, Alleghenian orogeny are pretty much contemporaneous in terms of when the main bulk of the deformation occurs. But the Achetan orogeny begins slightly earlier because these little islands start the process before the main mass of Gondwana makes impact. So the Alleghenian orogeny began in the middle to early Carboniferous and initially several volcanic islands accreted along Laurentia's east coast. This was then followed by the, the big collision between Laurasia and Gondwana and that's going to lead to the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. So the Achetan and Hercynian orogenies finished in the early Permian. However, now if you remember the Achetan orogeny, that's in the Gulf Coast region, the Hercynian orogeny, that's in modern day Europe. And so they were, they were related to the Alleghenian orogeny. However, they finished in the early Permian, but the Alleghenian orogeny actually keeps going all the way through until the late Permian. So it takes a little bit longer for the collision to stop in the modern day, what we call the modern day Appalachian region. So the free orogenies went and formed a continuous mountain chain similar in size to the modern mountain chain produced by the Alps, the Zagros Mountains and the Himalayas. So here's our basic model over here. We have Gondwana interacting with what is now modern day Europe. That gives us the Hercynian mobile belt. We have Gondwana interacting with Laurasia along what's the modern day, along what is, what, what is the modern day east coast of North America. That gives us the Alleghenian orogeny. And then we have Gondwana interacting with the modern day Gulf Coast region. That's going to give us the Achetan orogeny. And you can see we have this extensive mountain belt that continues from, from Europe down the East Coast and into the Gulf Coast region. So by the late Carboniferous, you can see we still have our high ground, the Hercynian orogeny over here, Alleghenian mobile belt here and a Cheetan mobile belt here. And of course, they're going to be producing large quantities of clastic sediments, which are going to be deposited into the Absaroka Epiric Sea. By the early Permian, you can see that most of the topography has been eroded away. So the collision has pretty much stopped in the Cheetan mobile belt, pretty much stopped in the Hercynian mobile belt, but there's still a little bit continuing in the Appalachian mobile belt. So it takes a bit longer to stop in this region compared to the Achetan and the Hercynian 
mobile uh, well, uh, erogenies. Okay, so that's it, everybody. So I know it was a bit of a complex one at the end there, but well done for sticking with me. So thank you for watching the presentation and take care.